Generative artificial intelligence will transform every industry and every business and every job. I recently read that statement by a journalist. A statement like that may have sounded like hype very recently, but one and a half years after the launch of ChatGPT, we've already seen work change for millions of people. Hello and welcome to the Digital Drucker Forum. Thank you for joining us today. We've actually never seen more registrations for a single Drucker session online. Uh, there have been 1,177 registrations as of an hour ago. My name is Jyoti Guptara, and it's my pleasure to moderate this free session, preparing us for our main event in Vienna this November, which of course is the Global Peter Drucker Forum, the world's leading management conference. And that's what other people say about us. Today's Digital Drucker Forum is under the heading, Knowledge is Power, Managing Smarter with Generative AI. And that's right in line with our topic this November. The next knowledge work, managing for new levels of value creation and innovation. So I'm really excited about the topic in uh, November, which is part of our five-year push, the next management. And it's never been more important. So think of today's digital session like an appetizer for what we're going to discuss in Vienna on November 14 and 15. That said, I'm sure you'll find it a special session packed full of inspiration and principles you can apply to your organization over the coming months before we hopefully see you in Vienna. Knowledge is power, but only if applied, right? That's why we have three pioneering speakers joining us who are going to share lessons from their own experience. We'll be hearing from Paul Allen, a serial entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of AI Studio Saw.com. We'll be hearing from Tuti Tigerly, a big tech design leader turned executive coach, and from Thilo Stadelmann, director of the ZHAW Center for Artificial Intelligence and the founder of Alpine AI. But before we hear from our speakers, we want to hear from you, dear participants. And I know it's early morning in Silicon Valley, where we have Tuti Tigerly calling in from, and quite late in East Asia. Um, so I'd like to ask the technical team to please bring up our poll so that our participants from around the world can tell us where they're at when it comes to generative AI. Thank you very much. We see here questions, uh, four questions, um, and your responses will help us understand you better and create our program for the in-person Drucker Forum. Some of you are really fast. I can already see people answering question number four. And I know you're fast readers and thinkers, so I'll just give you another 20 seconds to complete the poll. Question number one for anybody driving and unable to answer us. Our first question is how you would describe your personal use of generative AI. We still have some people who are not sure about the definition of generative AI, but most people are quite active users. About 15% of us use generative AI themselves and help colleagues to use it. And most intriguingly, we have several people who don't actually use generative AI themselves much, but they help their colleagues to. I love that. As for our second poll question, what is the status of your organization's generative AI pilots? We still have a lot of people, a surprising number, don't have any pilot yet, 40%. That is quite surprising to me. We have almost 40% uh, 
with an ongoing pilot. A very small percentage at about 4% says they had an unsatisfactory pilot. And it would be very interesting to hear what you did, whether you've abandoned future pilots, maybe you want to start sharing your experiences in the chat. Only 3% have looked back on successful pilots and are scaling up, or, or rather have already scaled up. We have 14% that are looking to scale. So today, uh, today's topic is the perfect one for you. As to our third question, does your organization have a formal AI policy or strategy? 44% do not. Again, welcome, you're in the right place to maybe start developing one. About a third of you are developing your formal AI policy and strategy. And as to our final question, what is your top priority for using Gen AI in your organization? And it's, it's pretty close between reducing manual effort and driving creativity and innovation. Enhancing team effectiveness is next, um, but they're all in the similar range. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share these results. Feel free to take a screenshot. And of course, we will be sharing these on LinkedIn with you, where we look forward to continuing the conversation. In summary, I think we're in the right place at the right time with the right theme. So let's dive in. Knowledge may be power, but time is money. Up until now, we've had to invest time to acquire and access knowledge. So knowledge management and knowledge transfer have been big investments, both for companies and individuals. AI has changed that. One example is the Drucker Forum itself. Over the 16 years since the first Global Peter Drucker Forum, we have built a library of countless videos of incredible leaders. If you're a Peter Drucker Society member, you have access to all this knowledge, but it took time and work to make use of it, didn't it? Because if you were looking for something specific, you couldn't be sure which of the hundreds of videos were relevant. And even if you had a lucky guess and you found the right video, you had to skim through one hour of content, maybe in one particular video, for that one case study or quote that you were looking for. Fortunately, the Drucker Forum has partnered with an AI company called Soar, Soar.com, that's S-O-A-R, like an eagle soars, because that's what Soar helps us do with our information. So Soar.com has transcribed and indexed our extensive video library so that every sentence is searchable. If you're a Peter Drucker Society member, no doubt you've already made use of that function, as have I. So a big thanks to our first speaker, Paul Allen, the founder and CEO of Soar, for making this game-changing software available to all of us. To finish Paul's introduction, Paul Allen has founded a total of eight companies, including the tech unicorn Ancestry.com, which has helped over 100 million people learn about their family history. No wonder the company sold for over $1 billion. Please join me in welcoming Paul Allen, who's going to share why generative AI is so relevant for managers. Paul, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Jyoti, for the fine introduction. And I love the surveys that you asked at the beginning. It's always fascinating to take a snapshot in time about how is a new technology being adopted and embraced and applied. And I just wanted to mention, I think we're in an unprecedented era in the history of corporations, organizations, leadership and management, in that, as the theme says, knowledge is power. And if you think about in terms of an organizational structure, in the previous decades that many of us have experienced, the amount of knowledge we have about the performance or the output of a particular person on our team is a, a small glimpse of what they actually do. 
we might have a one-on-one -on -one with them once a week and maybe they have a coach once a month but we get to talk about their experience at work what they're working on what their values are their priorities issues blockers and we get a small glimpse of their output and how they show up we might have a meeting with them a couple of times a week but in the new era of a hybrid workforce where meetings are digital, recorded, Zoom calls, all of the corporate emails are available, and now for the first time, AI that understands language, not just AI that's predictive of data or numbers, but AI is beginning to understand language. And if a meeting is transcribed, AI can analyze every word spoken by every person in that meeting. And in, a, in the past, and even in many organizations today, you might do, do a pulse survey of how people are feeling about work. And there's the famous Gallup Q12 questionnaire, which tens of millions of people have answered with the famous carefully picked 12 questions that predict or that reveal how engaged each person is at work. And they might anonymize the data, but then the leaders and managers are given insight into what percentage of my team members are engaged, fully engaged in work, what percentage are not engaged. And sadly, there are some who are actively disengaged. They don't like their job. They don't like who they work with. They're actively working against the best interests of the organization. And of course, those engagement frameworks are really important for leaders and managers. For the first time in history, a vast percentage of a person's daily work output is digital, recorded, digitally created, and can be analyzed now by these super intelligent large language model related AI platforms. And I actually want to start with a caution because knowledge is power. And we know that governments, for example, many governments are trying to capture digital content with, with CCTV cameras or with uh, metadata about phone calls. I mean, there's a lot of data collection going on in countries around the world. And many of us are alarmed about Big Brother, a surveillance-based government. And is that encroaching on our freedoms, on our liberty? In the workplace setting, there's an opportunity, and I, I uh, don't really want to describe it in a positive term, but there's the risk, I would say, that Taylorism from the 20th century, which uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor's School of Management, where he would use a stopwatch and clock the effort of the workers, as the manual workers, as they went from task to task, there is... Uh, a risk that AI can be misused by leaders and managers to analyze every word spoken, every action taken, every keystroke, every bathroom break with videos. It's like we're entering the possible era of dehumanization of hundreds of millions of workers by surveilling them. And leaders and managers might soothe their conscience by saying, well, profit is our biggest objective. We have to make a profit so that we can employ these people. And so there's a slippery rationalization slope that people might go down, but it's extremely dehumanizing to be on the other end, the receiving end of an AI that is surveilling or stack ranking you uh, on, on hundreds of variables against the rest of the team. And then the leaders decide they're going to uh, delete, uh, eliminate 5% or 10% of the lowest performers every year with AI doing the scoring. That's a very frightening possibility. And it's something we're hoping to design against. We think AI should be what we call pure AI, personalized, uplifting, responsible, and ethical. You'll hear a lot of corporations talking about responsible AI, ethical AI, trying to make it unbiased, trying to make it fair and equitable and inclusive. That's all good. But we think that there's personalized AI and uplifting AI. And as a leader and a manager, I would invite you to consider the ways, and I like that last survey of what percentage uh, I want to use AI to increase creativity, to save time with, with manual effort, uh, to empower your 
um, employees with more knowledge and skills. I think there's so many wonderful positive elements that AI is now presenting us with. And really for the first time in history, in addition to the risk of surveilling and stack ranking and kind of harming the human experience, there's also the possibility that for the first time, you could help people discover talents they didn't know they had with AI look, doing pattern detection. You might have a brand new employee and the meetings are being recorded, the emails they're sending are, are digital and AI starts to detect this person has potential. They have capacity. They have natural talent to do something that they might not know. The word SOAR from our name comes from Don Clifton, Dr. Don Clifton, the father of Clifton Strengths, used to be called Strengths Finder. Tens of millions of people have taken his 177 question assessment to discover their top five strengths. And we think that humanity, every single person on earth is born with natural talent. If you add practice and knowledge and skills to that natural talent, they can become excellent at something. And when a person is excellent at something, they get rewards and recognition and validation and, and they feel accomplished. They feel a sense of achievement. And human flourishing is really of the utmost importance. I think every leader in the world would want people that they are uh, serving to flourish, not only at work, but in life. And I think that AI is inviting us to consider how can we properly deploy generative AI tools and large language models and chats and agents to help our employees get to do more of what they do best every day, play in that zone of strength. If they have a weakness, which we all do, we have strengths and weaknesses, we're all a mixed bag, have an AI system built to help them offset their natural weakness or pair them with someone who has a natural strength that's complementary to their strengths. I just really think it's an unprecedented opportunity. There's unprecedented risks, of course. I'm a strong advocate against Taylorism from the John uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. I told Johnny Taylor, who's the CEO of SHRM, they've chosen to partner with SOAR as well as the Global Peter Drucker Forum has to potentially bring an AI platform into the workplace, into thousands of organizations around the world. And I said, you know, Taylorism 2.0 could be uplifting and positive use of tools and technology instead of dehumanizing. And, and Sherm's mission is to elevate the workplace experience for all workers everywhere. I think there's a really interesting moment in time where leaders and managers can evaluate every AI tool against a rubric of, is this general or personalized? Is this uplifting or dehumanizing? And of course, is it responsible and ethical? And there will be, of course, laws in many countries about the proper building and use of AI systems. I just think it's really important that we think deeply about what's the point of all of our work? What is the point of an organization, of a corporation? What role do leaders and managers play in that space? Because AI is going to come in and AI agents will be deployed by the millions to do work that humans used to do. But in side by side with the agents doing work that humans do, I spoke to a chairman of a company yesterday. The AI is now assigning engineers tickets on software development. And then the AI is doing more and more of the coding itself. The role of managers and employees will be changing from just doing all the work yourself to orchestrating a set of AI agents to do the work for you. And then you get to be the quality assurance. You get to be the human check, the human uh, approver of that work. Um, I just want to make it very, very clear that while AI has these potential risks, it truly does has the, have the opportunity to help you help your people be better and do better and be more productive, but in a uplifting way, not in a stress inducing way that creates pressure and um, undue stress on, on the human. Uh, I really think that we're entering a, an amazing era. Uh, it's hard to navigate the changes every week as Apple and Microsoft and OpenAI and Anthropic are launching new AI tools and systems and even large language models. NVIDIA now has a large language model. They may compete with OpenAI's ChatGPT 4.0 and who knows when ChatGPT 5 is going to come out. But I think we have to be super careful to 
analyze what is the point of using tools like this and what is the impact on our human work workforce. Let's put people first. Let's make sure that the systems we deploy are welcomed by them, that they get to choose, they have autonomy, they have agency on what they want to get better at. We don't just use a top-down approach to standardize and impose what you have to do or how you have to do it. Let's honor the individualization, the individual character and personality and strengths of our employees and our team members, and let's invite them to bring AI into their world in a personal choice way that helps them achieve the goals they have and, of course, helps the organization achieve its goals as well. So unprecedented risks and unprecedented opportunities at the same time. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate that kickoff. Um, if only everybody who works in AI were as conscientious as you, but it's good to know we have people like you at the forefront of developing and deploying AI. What you were saying about complementary strengths and pairing workers who would work together well reminds me of what Ray Dalio, the legendary investor at Bridgewater Associates does, some of you will know. He gets his thousands of employees to create baseball cards with statistics, just like you have of players. You know, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. Um, and I'm sure AI will bring a whole new level um, to helping people create these sorts of um, scorecards, and it'll be fascinating to see how we um, evaluate ourselves and each other compared to what AI does. Next, I'd like to introduce someone who got up very early to be with us today because she is based in Silicon Valley, and Tuti is going to show us how the best Silicon Valley leaders are using generative AI to transform their teams. Tuti Tigerly coaches startup CEOs to be more creative and confident in their leadership. She spent 22 years as a design leader in tech, including at places like Disney and Meta. Tuti is a best-selling author and writes for Harvard Business Review and Fast Company. Please give a warm welcome to Tuti Tigerly. Still on mute, Tuti. Hi there. All right. So excited to be with everyone today. I'm going to tell you stories and tools, and then we can dive in into, into a little bit more afterwards. Here's how to connect with me on the slide afterwards. So a story to start. One of my clients, Alex, is the CEO of a Series B funded startup in the data business. They had developed a unique solution to put tracking pixels into TV sets, into the actual hardware of the TV sets. So what they did with that is they tracked what shows consumers like to watch and, and when. So this data was used to create better ads. And you know, speaking of ethics, I, I spent four years working for, working for Facebook, so very intimately concerned with all the, all the thinking around what are the ethics of what we do. Well, Alex, the CEO, he pushed his team hard. He had sky high expectations. An immigrant to Europe, he was used to fighting his way to the top and needing to be better than everyone else. So Alex could see the exhaustion in his team's faces and he felt really bad. He wanted the teams to thrive and do well, to learn and grow and not burn out. And I think we want all of that for our teams but all that could happen later because first they needed to deliver otherwise everyone else working with gen ai might surpass them the startup would run out of money and they would all lose their jobs so the frustration that alex felt is similar to how many managers think about gen ai a lot of fear and very little play or creativity because as all of you put in the survey yeah, AI does enhance creativity. Generative, generative AI is creative. For the first time, we have AI that doesn't simply try to mimic human intelligence tasks like reasoning or problem solving purely based on pattern recognition. So a traditional AI task would be playing chess, like when IBM's Deep Blue defeated Gary 
Kasparov in 1997. But in contrast, generative AI is creative. As you all know, it makes new content. Some of it might be embellishments and hallucinations that aren't factually true. Yes, we have that to deal with, strengths and weaknesses. Yet other parts are beautiful collaborators to create poetry, music, art, photos, videos. We humans are inherently creative and innovative. Yes, I promise you are, even if you think you can't draw. But similar to how your camera phone let everyone have access to the photographer within them, now generative AI becomes a tool to let everyone have more access to creativity. Okay, but first, the work context, because we are here to manage smarter with Gen AI. But is management and work even supposed to be fun? Not for Alex. Alex, that CEO, he needed to hustle. He needed to work hard to get his ad tech solution scalable. And the only way he knew how was to push through it. It was lonely and it was exhausting. We've, we've all been in the hustle and the loneliness. It's no fun. Are you familiar with that feeling of overwhelm, exhaustion, juggling too many balls and trying to get everything done? Wondering if you can just make it to your next anniversary or promotion and dreaming of summer vacation or quitting or a sabbatical? Everyone, give a round of Zoom reactions if you've ever felt that way. And we'll stop here a moment. This is not an anti-hustle talk, I get it. I felt overwhelmed and wanted to throw it all away by quitting. I get it so much I wrote a book about leaving the corporate world called Make Space to Lead. But what hustle does, healthy hustle does, pushes you and pushes you in a way that feels easy and in flow. And you get to this place of healthy hustle by using generative AI. It makes you more creative. Like with Alex, hustle at all costs works really well to rise in your career. Hustle, similar to reworking existing AI patterns, helps you to rise. But at some point, it stops working. Imagine that. Because you hit your limit of how to deal with uncertainty or fresh problems. And then, and then you feel stuck. My favorite poster when I worked on at Facebook shows a rocking horse. It says, don't mistake motion for progress. Even if you're hustling to rock that horse and giving it your all intensely to rock it, can we see that it's going nowhere? Many leaders can feel stuck in this place, pushing harder and harder to rock back and forth, but without progress. Many leaders want more. And even if you're doing well, if you're, you yourself are very, very happy and pushing things through, your employees and your team members may not feel the same way. They may not be able to follow you. So the way to get unstuck is to open up your perspectives to new ideas. But guess what? As humans, we're not good at this. We get stuck in our patterns and negative habits. And this is where Gen AI as a creative collaborator comes in. So back to Alex. His ad tech product had achieved early signs of product market fit. TV watching had boomed during the pandemic, so his products were starting to soar. He hired more, he pushed more, he got more people, he doubled his team to try and win in this. But now he wasn't sure what was happening. Sales were stagnating. Competitors in the ad tech space who had jumped into the space because everyone was increasing TV watching, his competitors were leapfrogging his particular company. And working harder really didn't help him anymore. So he tried something new. He created a small tiger team to leverage Gen AI to explore possible new pivots to the company. The company had some great natural, ha natural assets. As with everything in the Gen AI space, it's not necessarily the algorithms that is the greatest natural assets. For Alex, he had a lot of TV watching data. They were lucky because data is the heart of originality with Gen AI. It's the competitive advantage. 
which is why many of the incumbents are doing really, really well in this space. So inspired by Gen AI, they tried a lot of new ideas because they had the TV watching data. Perhaps they'd create an AI platform that helps script, script writers and filmmakers predict potential success metrics for various storylines and suggest the edits. Or perhaps they would create an interactive AI companion to make TV watching more personalized. Or the actual killer idea that they eventually landed on, which you'll learn about soon when it hits the market. To become a more nimble company and to innovate faster, Alex did something somewhat crazy. He took the main bread and butter of the core ad tech product, the main revenue generator, and he sold it. He broke his company in two and he sold the main part of it, the generated revenue, but it was also the part that was stagnating, that wasn't growing at the 100x speed he wanted it to grow at. Then instead he relaunched a revamped company with 10% of the original staff to focus on the Tiger Team's product. And in San Francisco, his, his offices were just uh, a couple of blocks away in, in the mission from Gen AI. He, he ended up getting a lot of new investment in this innovative Gen AI-based AI idea. Alex couldn't get unstuck from where he and his company was with hard work alone. He needed the inspiration from generative AI to pivot the company. So Alex did have natural vision. You might not be as bold if you need a little help with that, and I surely do. A second tool that helps companies work differently is to use a concept I learned at Facebook called 50-50 goals for innovation. With 50-50 goals, as per the name, you only expect to hit half of your goals. So think about your goal setting. If you set goals and you hit 100% of your goals consistently all the time, you might think it's a good thing, but it's actually not because you haven't been setting goals that are big enough. And many high achievers have this problem. So 50-50 goals for innovation gives you the permission to dream bigger and crazier. And once you have a draft of goals, you can use Gen AI to amplify them. Most of my CEO clients of the most successful startups are very, very hands-on and they do this. They ask for the perspective to set goals, type it in, make these goals 50% bigger. Revise these goals if you knew you couldn't fail. Write these goals from the perspective of Barack Obama or Frida Kahlo and make them bigger. Enter whatever you want to be more innovative, more creative, to push more. And remember that what you get back won't necessarily be true, but it's simply a thought starter to expand ideas. It's your job to be the human editor. So my research has generated this innovation framework for Healthy Hustle. You start with your North Star 50-50 goals and the rest of the alphabet framework goes through the how, but since we're short on time, I'll simply let you in on the most important how. It's the last one, experimentation and failure. And this is where Gen AI comes in. To run an experiment, you need a hypothesis, a timeline to run the test, and an analysis of the, fi of the findings, which informs what you do next. So when I worked for a tech company, we had a hypothesis for creating a new way of sharing video. If we let people live stream videos instead of having to record and edit, would more people create videos? You might've heard of a maybe used a little product called Facebook Live. So as you know, the answer was a resounding yes. More people would make videos with Facebook Live. So this is the most important part of my talk. It actually doesn't matter if the experiment succeeds or fails. Sure, you want it to succeed, but that's not how life works. I've worked on three major failed projects at Facebook near and dear to my heart. You've never heard of them, and that's also great. But the hardest part is being okay with success or failure. Both outcomes are equally valuable. Gigi, fail, Gigi I think that, that is out. actually a, a great place to end for now, uh, mentioning your major failures as well as the success um, with the YouTube video and, and Meta. 
um, because we do want to get into the interactive discussion in one moment. Uh, I know absolutely. We um, many people are um, curious for the debate and discussion. Um, Tweety, also you mentioned the hypothesis. So after our final speaker presents um, some, uh, well, a strategic approach, we will dive into a panel discussion. Um, so just to um, explain the context here, we have our three speakers. About 10 minutes each from their own experience. Um, so we've heard from Tutti and Paul, and we have our final speaker who will be setting the stage based on his experience talking to dozens of boards and C-suite leaders. Um, so before our panel discussion, I'd like to bring up our final speaker, Thilo Stadelmann, Professor of AI and Director of the Theta Ave Center for Artificial Intelligence. Thilo, welcome, and thank you for joining us. We are curious what you have to share with us in terms of strategic advice for decision makers. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see the screen that I shared. Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. So we have 10 minutes, and I want to tell you why, from my perspective as an AI researcher and recent startup entrepreneur, uh, AI is a usefulness revolution and what that means for us strategically. Um, and because I'm a professor in computer science and AI, I have to start with the definition. What else? What is AI? And this is one of my favorite ones. There are a lot of them, but this one's really good because it brings it to the point. AI is the mimicking of intelligent behavior with a computer. Why do I like it so much? Because it brings in intelligence, but not in the way you could think if you uh, look at the front pages of the newspapers. AI is, to put it in simple words, the faking of intelligence. There is no overarching theory of intelligence in AI. It will not come from the computer scientists, I promise you. It might come from psychologists or neuroscientists at some point. But the computer scientists are working on this, a toolbox with different tools to produce intelligent behavior with a computer for specific cases. And for example, if you're as old as me, you remember the 90s and IBM Deep Blue uh, playing chess against um, Gary Kasparov. And there was the, um, there's an algorithm used there that exhaustively searches all possible um, things you can do as a player and then what the, your opponent can do and then what you can do. This brings you success in the end. And if you think this is old fashioned AI, you probably used it today when you stepped into a car, when you used a routing algorithm to bring you from point A to B, if you use a navigation device, this is one of the pillars of AI, clever search. But we wouldn't be here if search would be all AI has to offer. And the other side of this toolbox is machine learning, especially deep learning which became very, pro um, very prominent since 2012, roughly. Why? Because it can relate data that we are typically perceiving with our eyes and our ears. Um, it can relate such data to any other kind of data, basically relate a complex input to an output by means of, yeah, learning the connection between it. And in a very real sense, what we have since we have chat GPT and large language models, um, a model that can relate a context of text to basically the next word, and then by putting the next word into the context and producing the next word and so on, can actually write text and understand language in a way. Um, this is a machine learning approach as well. So basically the same tool from the AI toolbox, it learns to relate input to the correct output, can be an image from a cat to a, the label of a cat, can be a context of words, a bag of words, to the next word. So this is what the AI toolbox from the scientific side uh, has to give you. So how good is the result? Well, you probably use ChatGPT and, 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 and other tools like that a lot. So you, you know how good it is. But one thing to note here is important. It's unlike humans. It's completely different from the human approach to language, for example, because these are statistical models. Machine learning models are statistical models. And statistical models have a spe uh, are very specific in that 
a lot of different individual cases can be summarized by the same statistical model. You see it illustrated here with these data points that all sh share the same summary statistics and they look individually completely different. So a machine learning model can on average and probably already is in many cases be better than a human and in each individual case can be completely wrong. To show that more illustrative, Here's the old story, the riddle of the man and the goats and the vegetables. You probably know the man wants to bring his belongings, the goats and the vegetables, to the other side of the river, has a boat of limited capacity. And then this is usually used in intelligence tests. Um, uh, the human has to find uh, a clever order of how does the human go back and forth with the goats and the vegetables so that the goats and vegetables are not on one side alone and then the goats eat the vegetables. So this Riddle has been asked to the newest version of one of the best um, uh, large language models in a simplified version. You see it here circled in, in green. A man and a goat are standing at a river. How can they cross a river? And the system gives a brilliant answer. The man loads a goat into uh, the boat. They cross the river. The man unloads the goat. And then you see what it d does then. It brings in two more return trips of the human alone in the boat. Why, which is of course totally stupid, it would have been finished after the first round. Why are these two extra rounds included? Well, because it's a statistical model. It has read so often its training data about that this uh, riddle is about crossing the river multiple times that it is statistically so unlikely that the riddle is finished after the first crossing. So it makes absolutely no sense, this answer. And you have to keep this in mind. The principal limit of statistical models when you see the the great examples of what AI based on this principle can do. And when I'm speaking of great examples, I'm, for example, speaking of examples like the following one. You may have seen that video. Which is, of course, not the Joker playing a show. The Joker is dead, as we know. Uh, this has been Liliadi, and an AI system has replaced uh, the, uh, the 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 main person in the video by from a single image of the Joker. And you see how well that works. AI based on machine learning can do fantastic stuff, and at the same time be wrong in any single instance. And you have to keep that in balance when you think about the opportunities and risks of using that in your business. So moving on. The stuff is super useful, can be super useful in, in business, and that is why it's spreading out wildly, why everybody's using it. Um, we see here on this landscape of applications um, that almost half of it, the green upper uh, right part and the lower left uh, yellow part, half of the application is working on text, another quarter is working on visual input videos and images, all the rest of data is far off uh, here in the upper left uh, um, sphere. So it works best on text, images are catching up. And what usefulness it is, is it bringing? Colleagues from Harvard University did a study on skilled knowledge workers like us probably, and they evaluated the quality of their work if they used on did not use Gen AI. And the blue curve you see here in the middle is the qu average quality of the ones not using Gen AI versus increased by factor uh, by, by, by two from four to six um, for those who had the chance to, to access a tool like this. So the usefulness is lies in it, it makes you not just faster, it makes you better. It increases your, your creativity, as uh, Tutti said. What are people using it for? Well, for a number of things, Harvard Business Review found 100 different use cases. One of it is brainstorming, the one that I'm using it for a lot. And a lot of other ones, you can later have the slides and look into it yourself. If you're using it for brainstorming and you're working in a company, you have company use cases in mind. What you typically don't want is talk to a computer model about all the world and his wife. You typically want to talk about with such a model about the intricacies of your business, about proprietary data, about stuff you wouldn't share publicly on the internet. So how can you use a large language model and Gen AI on your own data without sharing it with a vendor you don't want to share it with? Um, we created a startup that is doing this, but the principle behind it is everybody is using it. And if you want to remember one tactical aspect from the pr presentation, remember this um, name of a technique, retrieval augmented generation. Retrieval augmented generation couples a search algorithm 
that indexes all your internal documents, your ERP system, your CRM system, your tickets, and so on, and pipes the result of the search through a large language model that can then phrase its answer only and solely based on the records it found in, you, in your own data. That by an order of magnitude or so reduces hallucination, so these statistical errors, and really makes a model like that helpful for your in-business context. You can even use it uh, on site. You don't have to use APIs if you don't trust them. Um, so that's very, a, a very interesting case how these models can be put into practice. Now, because we're coming to the end, what's the future of AI? And it's always difficult to, to predict the future. I have the feeling, and other people with me as well, that we are now having at least a situation as we had in 1992, 93, when the World Wide Web came online. Nobody could, Im could have imagined that this ugly web with magenta blinking fonts and so on would become the one unified portal to all our relationships, all our media and so on. It, it was a huge game changer in business and private life. We have such a moment, I think, with AI because it went through the usefulness barrier. And if you were ask me what happens, I think what we will have are potent cognitive orthoses, things that like glasses for our eyes enhance the sharpness of our thoughts. We will have in a couple of years from now, maybe sooner than, than later, AI agents that pass us very capable personal assistants to help us in daily work, for example, because they have some sort of understanding of the world that is useful. I'm not talking about super intelligence here and stories like that yet that you hear sometime um, in, in newspapers. I don't think that that will ever exist, but we will have agents that help us enlarge our capabilities of cognitive work. So how should you strategically position yourself in your, uh, in your work context to profit from that? And I think there are two important ways and you have to use both of them. One is top down. If you're in a leadership role, you have to look into your strategy. Where is AI on that? How can you achieve your strategy with AI? And where are your business cases? How can you make money and how can, AI, not just the generative part, but also the generative part, help you realize that profit. So it's very important that your board sits down and think about strategically, where do we want to use it? Where's our advantage? But at the same time, you have to use a bottom-up um, way as well. You have to enable your employees, all of them, to think about where would it help them in their daily work? Why? Because AI doesn't automate jobs. It does automate tasks, as Andrew Ng famously put. And again, Professor Lakani from Howard said, that's why we as leaders, we must experiment. We must create sandboxes for our team so that they can try it for themselves and see where it really helps. Because you as a board do not know exhaustively all the tasks that um, all your employees have. So use the wisdom of the crowd and see where does it help me to achieve my business cases. And if it doesn't help, well, just don't do it and do the other things and revisit it in three months because the topic is fast paced. With this, I'm at the end. I want to urge you to not fear because of super intelligence and existential risks. Go with caution, but go try it out what works for you. Identify your business cases, not just do a prototype project that never works. Um, yeah, let's just try, try AI and uh, that will usually fail. Identify real business cases find a partner that helps you and then implement it and empower your staff to do the same. This way you can benefit. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tito. It's very interesting to see the study that generative AI can improve the quality and not just the speed of our output. And um, I know a lot of people are concerned about uh, hallucinations, confabulations, making stuff up. Uh, which is why the RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, is such a game changer. In fact, I've been using it a lot myself as a writer and speaker and so on. Um, and I can encourage, if you're looking for a practical tool, uh, just to mention one I've been experimenting with recently that does RAG really well is Notebook LLM by Google. I was actually talking to someone at Google recently, and he didn't even know that they had this tool uh, because that's just how fast this space is moving. 
Um, now, Notebook LLM claims not to use your conversations and data for training. Who knows? I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, but there is one um, concrete thing that you can try as an individual leader, as a manager, uh, as a knowledge worker. Now, I'm looking forward to our panel discussion. We're going to have all three of our speakers back. Um, but first, I have the privilege of giving you a sneak peek of the actual Global Peter Drucker Forum this November. Um, as I said at the beginning, today's digital Drucker Forum is sort of like a warm up conversation on the road to our main event. Can we please have our speaker slide? And you'll see, um, as always, a fantastic lineup, some of the best business thinkers in the world, household names like Amy Edmondson and Roger Martin, top academics from places like Harvard, INSEAD, IMD in Cambridge, but also practitioners, business leaders uh, from companies like Visa. Um, and we have the chairman of Bosch smiling at us from the top left and many more. AI and generative AI are going to be major themes, along with other equally important topics that aren't currently in the limelight so much. So um, if you want a deeper dive, do block out November 14 and 15 on your calendar. Um, registration is open, and we do have an early bird ticket for the next two weeks. You can save 22% on a ticket, which equates to 500 euros. So that is a significant advantage that you might want to take uh, advantage of before July 16. And I think they'll be sharing the early bird link in the chat. Um, to our panel, and then I would like to open up for the public questions and answers. So I want to encourage everybody um, who's been um, listening to our first three speakers, and I'm sure you have questions about um, all sorts of things that our speakers shared. So please start using the chat. And in the meanwhile, I am excited to bring back Tuti Tilo and Paul for a conversation. I'd like to jump right in, um, piggybacking on the poll that our participants filled in at the start. We saw that a large number of people did not actually have an AI policy in place yet. I think over 40%. Um, so I want to, first of all, hear from you um, how important is it for organizations to have a structured AI policy? And I'm sure you'll all say it's very important. So please, um, 30 second answers. Um, what should such a policy include? What's your top one or two things? Um, ladies first, Tuti, do you want to go first? Yeah, I've uh, worked in many large organizations and worked with CEOs who have attempted to instill policy. And there is one where you do it from a complete risk mitigation and safety and protection, which completely makes sense for having more closed on-prem systems so that your data is, is safe. And I'll, we'll put that in there. But I think the biggest part of the policy, going back to Thilo's experimentation, is encouragement of individual use of it applying it in your day-to-day -day use case, because so many of us talk a lot about it, make policies about it, but don't have the hands-on usage of it, especially if you're at the manager or leader level. So those are the two aspects of policies I would really put in. Thanks, Tuti. Um, Tilo or Paul, who, who wants to go next? And, and how do we encourage this, this active use? I can go. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of boards and uh, sea levels in, in, in the last 18 months. And the ones that I perceived as very successful were the ones that wouldn't overdo it and over rush it with policy, but enabled their, their staff to experiment, which means to have sandboxes that are safe to experiment. I mean, if you put uh, put put your proprietary data and your secrets, uh, trade secrets into any open access, public, uh, non-login uh, API thing uh, and share it with the world, that's probably not a good good way of, of uh, governing this. And at the same time, of course, thinking through, okay, where do we want to go strategically? But don't stop short on, uh, on, 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 on uh, overthinking. I think this is one thing that I've seen some universities do and, and moving so uh, 
not fast enough in the end. Uh, I was speaking with Johan Rose, who is on the Draco Forum leadership team, um, who was talking about top down versus bottom up uh, policies. Uh, Johan has uh, pioneered for, for HALT International Business School, um, and that's why they've been at the forefront of AI use. So, um, Tila, what are your thoughts on top down versus bottom up? I would encourage both, but but not uh, wait too long with uh, uh, top down um, until bottom up can start. You mentioned sandboxes and boot camps, so I would love to hear if any of our um, speakers have um, great examples, either of successful cases or of disasters. Um, that happen and learnings out of that when it comes to boot camps, sandboxes, experiments. So one, one thing I've seen is we worked a lot with um, governmental bodies who were very cautious of what, what are we allowed with GDPR in Europe and so on. And um, they uh, what wanted to move quickly and what they did is they uh, deployed uh, models on premise on their own hardware or in their own data centers where they were sure that's allowed um, to enable their staff to try out things without second thoughts on who are we doing something that is in the end illegal or is it bad for the next election so that was a kind of of um, sandbox taking out the, uh, the uh, uh, legal risks out of the equation I will say one thing, uh, uh, Joe, and that is um, it's one thing to have a policy. It's another thing to give people a small budget to utilize and sign up for their own uh, paid version of GPT-40 or, or start trying agents. Um, the free versions are not nearly as good as the paid versions. So I would actually encourage people to have a policy, have a top-down policy. I have a friend who's the CEO of the largest sales training company. His policy is none of his franchisees can use an open large language model that might take their data and use it for training because it's the big models have already hoovered up and stolen basically all of their IP. So so he's got one kind of negative policy as uh, to risk mitigate, like Tutti said, but give people a small budget. $20 a month or $100 a month would enable almost anyone in your workforce to try out the latest, greatest agents or chatbots or tools. Um, and without that budget, without that encouragement, it's very unlikely that they're going to take the risk and, and do that. And, and so I, I really encourage, put money towards let, letting people experiment from a bottoms up standpoint. So one case study that I have, and keep in mind that most of the companies I work with are smaller startups, just very small, very nimble startups. One company that I advised did a hackathon, but you normally think a hackathon is for engineers, for people who know how to code, who know how to build things. I think what was really impressive is in a week-long hackathon, they had people from across the company, sales, marketing, everyone get, get their hands really dirty with hands-on experimental use of Gen AI to really show that, hey, you know, per some of the questions in the chat, you don't have to necessarily have the specialized skill of being a hands-on coder. Coder. Once you start to play with this, you can build creative, interesting, innovative things because it helps extend your tools. And I like that. I, I like to say the way to save time with AI is to waste time with AI. Um, so as you say, make, make space for those experiments, but maybe give some guidance as well. Um, we have a question from Thomas Lader. What are criteria for processes that have potential to be augmented with AI? I think that's a great question. What is the low hanging fruit that people should start with? Tilo, I think you have something to say. I, I, I really think it, the, the best thing one can do is to, to, to really look at business cases and where you have a pressing issue and then put the, uh, uh, you, you find the right tool or solution or, or, or method for that. <laughs> I have seen so many 
entities fail by thinking, oh, we should do something cool with and then put in the current, like uh, some years ago it was big data, now it's big AI. Uh, it's AI. Then they just started a prototype nobody was interested in because there was no no business value behind it. I think Bob, you said that. Um, so it's it's very important to start it with something where there's business pressure behind it, so that you're actually interested in the in the solution. Otherwise, nobody will take will be in charge and nobody will be interested. And yeah, I, I will say one thing. Um, we talk about models and computer models and frameworks and patterns uh, that that computers are really good at. It turns out that in your organization, you've got a top performer in your sales role. You've got a top performer in customer support, top, top performer in accounting, top performer. You all have top performers. What AI can do, which has never been possible before, is, is dissect what behaviors and techniques are those top performers using that the average performers or the low uh, performers are not doing. You can actually... You know, you can take a leadership framework like Stephen M. R. Covey's Trust and Inspire Leadership Framework. You can actually train your leaders on that framework and then AI can analyze, are they showing up as a trust and inspire leader the way he teaches, or are they showing up as a command and control leader? So you have outside models that you can apply and train and then reinforce that training. But better yet, you can take your top performers in every role and analyze what are they doing that's different. You know, Gong, for example, in the sales AI deployment, it says they say that you um, have a 27% higher close rate if your employees, if your salespeople are using Gong than if they're not using Gong. Well, what does Gong do? It analyzes what leads to a successful sale and closes a sale. And then they give that data to the leaders and managers. And then they teach the other salespeople how to close the sales as effectively as the top performer. I think that's one of the exciting things that we all have a chance to find the top performers in any role, understand what are they doing differently with AI crunching the data, and then inspire others to follow suit, use the same techniques and skills that they have uh, deployed already. The lowest hanging use case that I've seen, just piggybacking on both what Thilo was saying with the big data examples and Paul was saying on looking at your best performers is really looking at content. Content is, is data. One of the companies I advise has a, a business model of content creation where they're creating content to promote mental fitness and has an app for people to use this kind of like a headspace or a calm. The lowest hanging fruit for them is really, well, how do we automate and expand and share all of this content and make it searchable in a way similar to Jyoti's example earlier about going through the vast databases of Peter Drucker forum content. The, the most protected information that you have is your data, your proprietary data. And as long as you do it in a safe on-prem sandbox area, the easiest use case is how do you use AI to expand this content library and automate it, and then eventually enhance it if it's possible for custom chatbots, customer service bots. We have some great questions rolling in in the chat. Uh, um, so in terms of time, we'll just keep going for another 10 minutes because I think this is, this is really interesting stuff. Um, Alan Barnard um, is asking and commenting about what do you believe humans will retain in terms of advantages over AI? Now, I want to specify this question towards managers, and, and, and maybe you know we could speculate about where this is all going. But right now, um, we know that people are looking to, to augment, to automate. It's already happening. Um, a year ago, John Hagel warned us that a lot of organizations are simply looking to reduce headcount, right? And as we head possibly into a more challenging economy, that pressure is only going to grow. So let me specify this question and say, how can managers ensure that AI enhances productivity without replacing the unique value that humans bring to their work? I can jump in there. Managers, by virtue of the work they do, are managing teams of people. And with teams of people, there is always emotion. There is managing the, the messiness of humans. Yes, AI can be used to assess, all right, of this large group of people, if I need to do a 20% riff, what are the people and what is the criteria for what the riff is going to be? 
And it can also come with scripts. What do I say to these people when I'm sitting in a room with their face-to-face -face contents of having to let someone go? But ultimately, AI helps you generate things, generate scripts, generate lots of options. In the end, the human's the editor. You're the person who knows the emotion, the person sitting across the table from you. Use all of this as inputs, as creative collaboration ideas, but in the end, you're the editor. You make the decisions. And if you have that approach with generative AI, you'll never be fooled by the hallucinations because in the end, the human's the final editor. I guess this is why I had the this notion of the cognitive orthosis on 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 the slides. I I don't believe in 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 all this that AI is being so super intelligent that it is autonomously doing everything and we will be I don't know uh, pit, self pity somewhere in the corner. I think it works best at least for the foreseeable future and this is I don't know the next ten years or so. Uh, it works best in the human AI teaming. And that means it's not so super important if per, per se if it hallucinates or so uh, as long as an expert is there and 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 it helps this expert in uh, in doing the job. I think one exciting thing about AI doing so many repetitive tasks and even beginning to do creative tasks is that humans will be freed up. Uh, with lots more efficiency and productivity, we have time to be what we can be that that computers cannot be. And that is a caring, empathetic person building relationships one-on-one -on -one with other people and believing in them and showing them that they have potential. I think every one of us can trace our career successes to someone noticing talent that we had or potential that we had, giving us an encouraging word. I don't think the AI will ever do that. I think Don Clifton, who authored Strengths Finder, said strengths only develop in relation to another human being. I think the true uh, greatness of humanity is that we can love and care and inspire and create. And of course, computers and Optimus robots, billions of them, as Elon Musk is saying, will probably do all kinds of things. They'll produce, they'll build, they'll plant, they'll harvest. There's all, all, so many things that will be automated in the coming decade. But the you can't replace the fact that a teacher sees potential in you or a manager gives you a challenge that they know you can do, but you don't know you can do it. And your own ability and capacity as a human goes up because somebody expressed care and expectation of you that was in alignment with your possibilities. So where do we start uh, for, for our managers on the call? How should they guide this? We've talked about sandboxes, we've talked about experiments and AI policies. What is the first step after this call? I would say you've got to find out what everybody's doing or afraid to do. So do a survey, have a conversation, make sure everybody in your organization is letting you know what are they testing, what are they trying. I love the hackathon uh, story, Tootie. I think that's fantastic. I'm encouraging a small budget for everybody, but find out if they're afraid, if they feel empowered, what are they doing now? And then organize an effort to uh, to help everyone increase their productivity, but not not decrease their humanness, not to you know aim for replacing humans. But I noticed on the survey at the beginning, the fourth survey you asked, uh, Gioti, the lowest answer was helping humans get more skills and capacity. I actually think that might need to be the first answer is how can you use AI reinforcement or AI tools to help your humans get more skills and more knowledge and become better humans because otherwise, you know, I was talking to this CEO yesterday. He said, 10x developers will become 100x developers and AI won't replace developers, but developers using AI will replace developers not using AI. So try to find ways to understand what everybody's doing, but empower your people to become better, faster and more productive than ever before. But in a in a joyful, uplifting way that, that plays to their strengths, that lets them experience uh, flow state uh, and do their best work with the help of AI. I have a very specific next step for everyone. And it really is get your hands dirty and use this for yourself. So if you follow the QR code and give a little bit of feedback to the talk, you'll get a free link to my Udemy course, which is how to build your, your leadership brand using generative AI. 
I encourage this because this is not proprietary data. This is information about you and how you want to be perceived as a leader. And it shows you how generative AI can be creative, both for text and image style generation. And what it does is it gets your hands dirty. As Thilo said, you start experimenting with it and doing it. And once you do that, then you have a deep felt sense of what Gen AI can do. Thanks, Tuti, for, for giving that course of yours away to, to all of us to help us get our hands dirty. Um, also, somebody has been asking for Tilo Stadelmann's um, slides, and we'll make sure you receive that. Um, any final advice, um, especially strategic advice that you have for us, if I could ask for some final statements from each of you? So, one thing I've seen uh, since uh, value creation from data has become a thing in the last 10 years, and, and that just continues with AI, is that in a, it enables new forms of collaborations, um, uh, meaning entities, companies that wouldn't ever collaborate in a normal setting because they would perceive themselves as competitors, for example, uh, or that wouldn't ever cross their path because they're in so different industries, can now collaborate on something uh, because AI data analytics solves problems on a very abstract level. So the same technology, the same methods can help tackle completely different business cases. So you can team up as a bank with a company from uh, from 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 that has a production factory, because you on an on the abstract level from the perspective of an AI engineer, you have the same problem in finance and in uh, uh, in, in in production. And what I have seen that this is a huge benefit to team up with partners, for example, from from academia with uh, industry partners that come from completely different sides um, and tackle challenges together um, where you are not in the competition mode. Thanks, Tilo. I, I will say my general advice is to take the words of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. There is so much fear in the world today around existential threats, including AI, and yet it's the greatest enemy to progress. And while we do need leaders that are wise and avoid some of the uh, bad things that, that technology can do, Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish philosopher, my dad used to quote him all the time. He said, humans, I'll paraphrase, humans are tool using animals. Without tools, humans are nothing. With tools, humans are all. AI is the best set of tools ever created for humans by humans. And we can do more and accomplish more than we ever imagined if we embrace it. But if we're afraid of it, or if we promote fear and people don't use it, they're missing out on the greatest productivity increase that has ever been created for human animals. I mean, it's just truly astonishing where we're going. And if we embrace it and use it for good, instead of worrying about a few bad actors that use it for bad, we all lose in that scenario. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, in fact, the, the, the less people with the right intentions um, who are part of this, the more room we leave to the bad players. Tuti, a final sentence from you. Get out and get your hands dirty. I want you to play with it and see how creative generative AI can make you. It's magical, magical. Might not have to be a work use case. Just start using it. Absolutely. As a novelist, I can only concur that I don't need ChatGPT to write books for me. I can do that, but it's a wonderful sparring partner. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how all of our participants start playing with this powerful tool um, to uh, engage that side of their co-workers that maybe has been uh, neglected. We could easily keep going for the rest of the day, but our time is up. Tuti, Tilo, and Paul, thank you for this wonderful session. Let's show our appreciation for our wonderful speakers with some uh, emojis and making all of this virtual applause noise. As we heard, we are only at the start of seeing the impact of AI on knowledge work. Things are moving at breakneck speed, so we're all curious where they will be in four months as many of us gather in Vienna. AI will be one of the key themes 
at our main event, the Global Peter Drucker Forum in Vienna, Austria, on November the 14th and the 15th. Um, uh, that's right, you get two full days where we can really go in depth uh, and we can have conversations in person because I was watching the chat and we have so many uh, incredibly knowledgeable people in our community uh, and I saw even some technical conversations going on there. Um, so I encourage you to think about attending in the next few days so that you can take advantage of our early bird offer. Um, in fact, it's more than two days because we have three events the day before, November 13. Um, we have several closed events, which are organized by various partners and sponsors. Um, last year, we had 600 participants join us from 39 nations at the Hofburg, Vienna's Imperial Palace. Um, I hope you are able to make it this year. Um, we have on the screen a QR code and uh, the details of that early bird discount. You can save 500 euros, that's over 20% on the ticket until July 16. To recap, generative AI is going to be a game changer for managers and we need to get our hands dirty, observe what other people are doing and not be afraid of partnerships as well with people who are not in competition with us, which is why it's so wonderful we get to convene these sorts of conversations. Thanks again um, to our speakers. Thank you also to Richard and Ilse Straub, our founders. We would not be here without you. Thanks also to the team who helped set this up, Astrid, Johan, Shadi. And finally, thank you everyone for joining this Digital Draco Forum. Stay connected on LinkedIn and by visiting our website and social media. Stay curious, keep experimenting and keep generating because knowledge is power.